wherever you are, and I mean really wherever, because we're here in the Phoenix Cinema in Kirkwall, and a welcome to our audience here tonight, but also, thanks to the miracles of technology, we are, well, in your own sitting room, wherever you may be. I'm hoping, too, that there'll be some listeners in Shetland listening and watching this evening, because we've got a great story to tell about some amazing achievements in Shetland. Over two centuries, in fact, the remarkable development of the salt fish trade that took fish from Shetland all over Europe. And our speaker this evening is a man with a lifetime's knowledge of Shetland fishing. John Goodlad is a Shetlander who works in the seafood industry. John was the voice of the Shetland fishing industry as the chief executive of Shetland's Fishermen's Association for many years. Before, farmer. John now advises several national and international seafood organizations and companies. His previous book, The Cod Hunters, was shortlisted for the Maritime Foundation's Mountbatten Award for the best maritime book in 2020. His new book is called simply The Salt Roads, and it's absolutely full, as you will hear, of Shetland and the sea and remarkable achievements of the Shetland fishermen. Now, there's an opportunity after John's presentation to ask questions, and here in the cinema, the opportunity is through the roving microphone. But for our listeners at home in many places, Technology is also available. There is, if you're watching on YouTube, YouTube chat, but there's also a, a new system that we've been able to use. It's called Slido, and you'll see it here on the screen. Basically, it involves a QR code, scanning it with your phone, and if you don't have a phone for any reason or prefer to have it switched off and concentrate on the screen, well, there is also the website. Slido, and there's that code number 34355541. But it's a great pleasure to welcome someone well known in, or in Orkney, a Shetlander well known in Orkney, and to ask him to tell us the story of the Salt Roads. John, wel welcome to you. Well, thank you, Howie, for that. Uh, very kind introduction. Um, I'm delighted to be back in Orkney. I've been lucky to visit at Orkney many times over uh, many years, and it's, uh, it's always just wonderful to come to Orkney and compare and contrast this community uh, with Shetland. Both communities have so much in common and yet uh, are quite different. Um, tonight I want to talk about the salt roads, how salt fish connected Shetland with the rest of Europe for more than 200 years. And the salt roads were the ocean voyages made by Shetlanders to catch fish, and then the routes used to export salt fish. And for hundreds of years, Shetland was at the hub of a salt fish trade which spanned the entire European continent. And I think in the modern world, uh, we forget perhaps how important salt fish and any kind of salt protein for that matter was. We live in a world now where we can shop and get fresh food, our just-in-time supply chains. Uh, we can more or less buy anything we want in a supermarket from any part of the world. It was not always like that. And even as recently as 50 or 60 years ago before home freezing became a thing in most homes, salt beef, uh, salt meat, and salt fish was an essential part of the diet. And uh, perhaps we forget a little bit about how incredibly important it was. Salt fish became an insurance policy for many people against malnutrition during the winter. And certainly in the eastern part of Europe, uh, salt fish was very often an insurance policy against starvation during a particularly bad uh, winter. In much of northern Europe, Economies, societies, and cultures were built up around the salt fish trade. Catching fish, salting the fish, drying it, and then exporting it. And I'm talking about Iceland, Faroe, Norway, 
and Shetland to some extent. Um, and uh, salt fish is still produced in certain parts of the world. Here's a piece of dried salt cod uh, produced by a Norwegian company. And this was at the Barcelona Seafood Show just a couple of months ago. And uh, this is still exported to Spain and Portugal, where it's used to make bacalao, that wonderful Iberian dish, uh, which I'm sure any of you who have been on holiday there uh, may have tasted. And this is a, a piece of dried salt cod, like any dried salt fish. It's as hard as a piece of wood. It's light. All the moisture has been taken out of it. Um, you could keep this for 10 years, soak it for 24 hours, and eat it. It was an incredible way to preserve protein. So important to the European diet several hundred years ago, and, and indeed quite recently in some cases. And I mentioned all of these communities around northern Europe where, uh, which grew up catching fish, processing it, and exporting it. And no one, I think, articulates the importance of salt fish better than the Icelandic Nobel Prize winning author, Haldor Laxness. I don't know if any of you are familiar with his writing, but he's a wonderful author, and he deals with incredibly important philosophical and moral issues in the most mundane of settings. And in his novel, Skaldavalda, which is all about a precocious young woman uh, working in the salt fish trade in a fishing village in the south of, Ireland, uh, south of Iceland, it was written in the 1930s, and it's all about feminism, it's about gender, it's about big issues about the meaning of life. And right in the middle of this novel, in his very laconic Icelandic way, Laxness says, when all is said and done, life is first and foremost about salt fish. And that kind of sums up the kind of society that Iceland was. And for a large part of Shetland's history, nobody would have even been the slightest bit surprised if Halder Laxness had made the same comment about Shetland society. So what I want to do uh, tonight is to look at the three big fisheries that came to define Shetland his history. The half fishery, which was a fishery using open boats, the famous Shetland six rings, fishing 20 or 30 miles from Shetland, catching mostly ling and tusk, which was then salted and dried. And then the distant water cod fishery, undertaken by cod smacks, fishing around Iceland and Faroe, again taking the fish back, salting and drying it, and exporting mostly to Spain. And then finally, the biggest fishery of uh, them all, the drift net fishery for herring. Um, the half fishery began in the 18th century and reached a peak in about the middle of the 19th century in Shetland. It was undertaken by six rings. And this is the Vela May, which was built about 10, 12 years ago uh, as an exact replica of the hundreds of six rings that once sailed around Shetland. Um, powered by six oars, uh, that hence the name six rings, and uh, a single sail. At one stage, there were probably 500 of these six rings employing 3,000 men fishing uh, around Shetland. And uh, it set, uh, these vessels set a long line, uh, and a uh, baited long line, and caught ling and tusk. They were at sea for a couple of days, which is not long, but you know, you're at sea in an open boat without any shelter, without any means of cooking hot food, for, for two days. It must have been exhausting. And uh, of course, even though this was a summer fishery from May through to August, nevertheless, being out in the middle, uh, being around, fishing around Shetland with a small open boat was dangerous. Lives were lost and disasters weren't uncommon. In 1832, uh, 17 boats and over 100, and over 100 men were lost. Uh, and again in 1881, 10 boats and 58 men were lost. These were exceptional storms that uh, decimated the huge fleet of tiny six rings trying to make their way ashore. And these kind of boats were common throughout Scandinavia. Um, you can see from the uh, design of the Vela May, there's the classic Norwegian design, 
Um, and at one stage, these boats were, were partially built in Norway and exported to Shetland in the 18th century. It was almost a forerunner of IKEA. They were the, 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 the planks and the ribs and everything was made ready, and then they were assembled in Shetland. And by the 19th century, the Shetlanders started to build them themselves, but copied the Norwegian style. So these six rings were commonplace uh, all over uh, Europe. And in Iceland, um, they had the same problem with loss of life and, and, uh, and boats being lost in bad weather. And the Icelandic author, Kalman Stephenson, he describes the Icelandic Sixerine as cockle shells the size of coffins, which kind of describes exactly what they were in so many cases. Once uh, the fish had been caught, and the fishing for the half was operated from half stations, from these were places at, ex at the extremity of Shetland, but very near the fishing grounds. And this is a picture of one of the last half stations, and right at the end of the 19th century, at Faitherland, at the north mainland of Shetland. And the fishermen would come here for the summer. They would come in May and stay all year until the fishery finished in August. And they would live in lodges on the beach, and they would operate their boats, sometimes anchored, sometimes hauled up, going out for two or three two-day trips per week. Uh, and they would land their fish uh, on the beach. And then the fish was, after being salted, it was laid out to dry, and that work was done by the beach boys. Uh, no relationship whatsoever to the Californian culture of the 1960s. These were the and their lives couldn't have been more different. This was a, a repetitive, back-breaking, hard job for young boys who were too young to be fishermen. Um, you usually became a fisherman at the age of 14, so these boys were 11, 12, 13. And it was their job to keep turning the fish to make sure it, it, the salt fish became dry and to keep watching for rain and to gather the fish up and put a tarpaulin over the top of it in the case of rain. Um, so that was the, the half fishery. It was absolutely huge. It dominated the Shetland economy. And, but, and it was quite unique to Shetland. And you can only understand this fishery, paradoxically, if you understand land tenure in Shetland. During this time, the 19th century, in Scotland, in the Highlands and Islands, the lairds were clearing the tenants, the crofters, off their land in order to make way for sheep. They could make more money from sheep than gathering uh, rents from, uh, from impoverished tenants. In Shetland, the lairds found there was an even better way to make money than sheep, and that was to dry and salt fish and export fish. And so the system of truck was born. It was a form of debt bondage that l differed little from serfdom. The crofters had to fish for the laird. They had no choice. They had to crew the six rings under the pain of eviction. If they refused to fish for the laird or they tried to sell their fish to an independent merchant, they were cleared off the land. And they had to buy everything that they needed from the laird store. The result was they got a very poor price for their fish from the laird, but the, laird, the prices in the laird store were very high. The lairds held all the cards, the fishing disasters, the loss of life, the unsuitability of fishing offshore with these small open boats, but the system never changed. Uh, and it was, it was held together because profits were made and because the truck system ensured that the fishermen had to fish for the laird. And um, the, the, the system only changed in 1886 when the Crofters Act was passed. And the Crofters Act, of course, was passed in Westminster as a result of the increasing opposition to the clearances, the increasing feeling that this wasn't right, that people were being cleared off the land. And in Shetland, of course, people weren't cleared off the land because of the importance of this fishery. The laird started to subdivide the crofts. The more crofts, the smaller they were, the more men they would have to crew the six rings. So in contrast to the whole of Scotland, where people were cleared off the land, in Shetland, the crofts were subdivided and subdivided. And the crofts were impossibly small. You couldn't make a living from them. But that happened in order to provide crews for the lairds 
uh, Laird's boat. So the population of Shetland increased dramatically during the early part of the 19th century, reaching well over 32,000 in uh, 1861, I believe. But in 1886, the Crofters Act was passed, and uh, at a stroke, that removed the Laird's right to evict a tenant from the land. Uh, and for the first time ever, Crofters had the security of tenure. It transformed the crofting communities in Scotland, and the Scottish historian Tom Devine calls the Crofters Act the Magna Carta for Highland Crofters. I would argue that the Crofters Act was also the Magna Carta for Shetland fishermen and their families. At long last, they were released from the iniquity of the tr truck system. The half fishery didn't completely end in 1886. It continued, but by the early 20th century, it was over. Now, alongside the half fishery during the 19th century, there developed this incredible distant water fishery uh, undertaken by deck cod smacks, the so-called uh, ferro smacks, and they began fishing the fishing grounds uh, between Orkney and Shetland, uh, called the home grounds, but very rapidly uh, moved on to fish around Faro, Faro Bank, and the coastal grounds around Faro, Rockall, and the northeast coast of Iceland. And I, I always like looking at this map and just reflecting on the fact that you know, we live in a world today where we look at going places in terms of roads, rail, and flights. And uh, for many people in Shetland, they never think twice of going down for a weekend to Edinburgh or maybe nipping down to London. And, uh, but these cod fishermen, many of whom had never been in Scotland, let alone in England, ever in their lives, fished for most of their lives and knew the fjords of Faroe and the bays of Iceland like the back of their hands. And they had an appreciation of geography uh, in its real sense that we've perhaps lost today. They knew that Faroe was far closer to Shetland than Edinburgh is. And they knew that the northeast of Iceland was far closer than London was. Um, the Cod smacks were crewed by 14 to 16 men. There were about 90 of them at their peak in 1870s. And they fished with hand lines, and they caught exclusively cod. And uh, the, uh, the cod, and these trips lasted, unlike the half when they went to sea for a couple of days, these trips would last 12 weeks or 14 weeks. They were at sea for almost three months. They did three long trips every year. So the cod was caught and it was salted on board the ships and then taken back and, uh, and, and uh, laid out on the beach to dry, the same as the fish from the half. Although these were decked ships and big ships, nevertheless, uh, there were also many losses. Uh, here's a wonderful painting of the Choana uh, making its way to Iceland in a gale. Uh, you can see that the, the sails are fully reefed and the crew were on deck in their oilskins, no wheelhouse on deck, everything was, was in the open. This was the North Atlantic that the, the, the cod hunters had to face uh, every year. And needless to say, there were many losses during the entirety of the, of the cod fishery from Shetland. I think there were something like 16 smacks lost, and every time a smack was lost, you probably had many brothers on board, you had fathers and sons, and you very often had people from the same village or same township being lost. So the extended families uh, were lost. Um, unlike the half, this fishery was kind of different. It was, some of the lairds were involved as smack owners, but most of the owners of smacks were the new class in Shetland, the merchants who weren't landowners necessarily in their own rights. And uh, although the cod fishermen were paid very, very poorly, uh, to get a job on a cod smack had nothing to do with your ownership of a croft. So it tended to be very young men, perhaps, who didn't own crofts, sons of crofters, who were the main uh, crews on board the cod smack. And uh, like the uh, beach boys drying the, the, the cod and the tusk, the, uh, the ling and the tusk, uh, 
the beaches were used for drying cod. And uh, whenever uh, it, it, there was the risk of rain, and at night the cod were always dried in what was piled together in this amazing cube of fish, which was called the steeple. And, uh, and that was to keep the rain or the dew off. After about six weeks, it was uh, fully dry and ready to be exported. I mentioned that um, these cod fishermen didn't earn a lot of money and times were hard. Uh, but the ingenuity of these Shetland cod fishermen, through their ingenuity, they found two unbelievable ways of making some extra money. First of all, um, in the 19th century, there was no excise duty in Faro applied to tobacco or alcohol. Um, so effectively, the Faro Islands was like a huge duty-free store, whereas in Shetland, full excise duty was applied on all alcohol and tobacco. So it perhaps wasn't surprising that fishermen from Shetland began to take home uh, brandy from Faroe. And I had been, uh, I grew up with stories of smuggling brandy from Faroe, and I'd always assumed, you know, it was on a fairly modest scale uh, for home consumption. And obviously, because it was illegal, there are absolutely no archival records whatsoever of brandy smuggling in Shetland. Um, the only archival records that exist is when the customs did catch somebody and they were sent to prison or had to pay a hefty fine. So there was no indication of how, how much brandy ever came back other than these stories which were passed down from generation to generation. And I couldn't have been the only young Shetlander spellbound uh, listening to older people tell the stories about the smuggling of brandy from Pharaoh. Anyway, about 10 years ago, uh, with a group of friends, we chartered the Swan, which is the old herring smack from Shetland, which is owned by the community, a regular visitor to Orkney. Some of you may have seen her. So we sailed up to the Faroes. We had spent 10 days. And on our way back, uh, we went in past Suderoy, the most southerly of all the Faroese islands, into the port of Ferroiri. And we were going to stay a couple of days. And uh, so we were lying at the pier. And uh, above the pier was a, a bar cafe, um, uh, wh which was owned by this lady, Anna Kirsten Thompson. So we were sitting in one day just having a beer or a coffee or whatever, and she came across to us and said, are you, are you guys from Shetland? And we said, yeah. She'd seen the swan and seen the Shetland flag. And she said, oh, my great-grandfather, when this used to be his merchant house, he did a lot of trade with Shetlanders. I said, oh, that's really interesting. Yeah, and she kind of smiled and she says, you know, it was mostly brandy and tobacco he sold. And I said, that's really interesting because I've been looking into this and I can't find any records of how much it was. Oh, she says, it was quite a lot. She says, my grandfather kept meticulous records for his company. And my ears pricked up and I says, oh, I'd love to see those. Are they in an archive in Torshaven or in the archive in Copenhagen? No, no, she says, they're just in here next door. So we went into this uh, uh, room, uh, which was the old office with an old, uh, beautiful old desk and chair and there were all the leather-bound ledgers. And although they were all in Danish, very easy to read, you could read who bought brandy, on which date, which smack he came from, how much he paid, and when it was paid back. And I was astonished. The average wage for a cod fisherman in the mid-19th century was £18 a year for three long, hard cod trips. Some of these fishermen were buying brandy for 20 pounds, 21 pounds, 24 pounds. Imagine any of you spending more than your annual salary buying contraband, which was entirely illegal, and if you were caught, you would be sent to prison. So, this, so the use of brandy back in Shetland wasn't some supplement. This was smuggling on an industrial scale because back in Shetland you could sell it at a profit. And the second thing which surprised me was that payment for the brandy was made a full year after it was bought. So the Danish merchants, or the Faroese merchants, I should say, uh, gave a full year's credit. So it was a unique business opportunity. You rocked up at Faroe, 
you bought a whole pile of brandy, provided you didn't get caught, you sold it at profit, and you only paid for it the next year. Huge scale of operation. And then just as I was going through this and trying to build up a picture of it, I discovered that one of my own ancestors, William Goodlad, had bought uh, three, three brandy pigs and a chumper for some reason. A very, very, very modest amount. I think it was about three pounds. He clearly wasn't into smuggling on an industrial scale. And he was 18 years old at the time. And then I researched my own family history. And he was lost on a smack called the turquoise, which was lost with all hands uh, eight years later. So fascinating how important smuggling was as a supplement to the cod, uh, cod fisherman's income. The second way they made additional money was equally fascinating. Salt fish was how everybody ate their fish. And I don't know how many of you have eaten salt fish. And I'm fascinated by the trade, but it's a bit boring day after day after day. And if you had any money at all, you were prepared to pay a fortune for fresh fish. And the wealthy middle classes in London in the middle of the 19th century, when the railway was established between Grimsby and London, were prepared to pay huge prices for fresh cod. And there was a little bit of fresh cod taken into Grimsby and kept in these wooden boxes, which were then taken ashore, and the cod was discharged absolutely fresh and went down to London the next day. The Shetlanders saw this opportunity and they decided to make seawater wells on board their smacks. So that was putting in bulk's heads in the middle of the ship and drilling holes in the hull, allowing seawater to come in. So the boat was half full of seawater. It sounds incredibly dangerous and incredibly uh, uh, unseaworthy, but it wasn't. If it was done properly, it was absolutely safe. And what they did on the last week or a couple of weeks on their trip from Faroe to Iceland, they filled this seawater well with live cod, sailed right down to Grimsby, landed these cod into these boxes, and then came back to discharge the, the biggest part of their catch, which was uh, salt cod. So Shetlanders were taking live cod from Iceland all the way to Grimsby on board sailboats in the middle of the 19th century. We often think this was a, we're in highly sophisticated and technological, but um, an incredible way to augment their earnings along with the, the smuggling. So the cod fishery reached its peak in about the 1870s. It was employing about a thousand men on board these uh, 80 or 90 cod smacks. The half fishery was continuing, 3,000 men employed on the 500 six rings. Both fisheries uh, began to decline towards the end of the 19th century. And the main reason for, the, for these fisheries, both, in fact, eventually disappearing from Shetland, was very simple. It was herring. Shetlanders discovered how to catch herring. Shetlanders had really been behind the curve in that. Uh, in Scotland, the northeast of Scotland, and in Caithness and the inner Murray Firth, the herring fishery had started in the late 18th century, places like Wick and, and uh, Leibster and, and so on. I don't know if any of you read uh, Neil Gunn's wonderful novel, Silver Darlings, which is set at the time of the beginning of the, of the herring fishery in the Murray Firth. And, and that was taking place. And at that time, Shetland, Shetlanders were completely preoccupied with the half and cod. They weren't interested in herring. They were making too much money uh, fishing distant water for cod or with a half. Even in Orkney, uh, the Orcadians were catching herring very successfully in the 1820s and 1840s. But it wasn't until the 1880s that Shetlanders began to discover they could catch herring around Shetland. And when they discovered, not only could they catch it and process it, but they could make a lot of money by doing so, suddenly there was this huge explosion. Unlike the other two fisheries that caught the half and the cod that caught fish by lines, the herring fishery was based on nets, and the nets were hung below the surface uh, in a long curtain of netting, dependent on the herring rising from the seabed every night and swimming into the net. If you were successful, you'd get a catch of herring, and 
the herring were caught all around Shetland, and you'd come in and land your herring the next day where it was gutted and salted. And this, uh, so it was gutted and then salted into barrels. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't dried, unlike the, the half and the cod, but it was wet salted into barrels, and it could keep for, for, for many years. Um, by 1905, there were over 400 sailboats in Shetland, fishing with drift net, employing more than 3,000 men at sea, and probably the same numbers of women uh, in the curing yards, gutting the herring. The herring, the barrels of salt herring, were exported to Eastern Europe. The cod was mostly exported to Spain, uh, where it went to the Basque country, to Bilbao and Santander. Uh, so that was very much a link that Shetland had with the southern parts of Europe. But with herring, it was different. The herring was exported to Germany, to Poland, and to Russia. It was a relatively cheap source of protein, and uh, the herring uh, was exported to St. Petersburg, to Stettin, to Konigsberg, to Lübeck, to Hamburg. And from these Baltic ports, it was transported right into the heart of Eastern Europe. And uh, salt herring from Shetland became an indispensable part of the diet of the peasantry of Eastern Europe, and particularly so in the Chettles, the incredibly poor Jewish communities of rural Poland and rural Russia. And uh, a barrel or two barrels of salt herring was essential to allow these uh, incredibly poor people to survive through the winter. By 1905, over two million barrels of herring were being exported from Shetland to Eastern Europe every year. And by this time, Shetland was being described as the herring capital of Europe. Uh, it was such an important part of the European herring fishery. And the herring fishery is, of course, known for its size. It, 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 the half fishery and the cod fishery disappeared. Everybody looked to herring. The early 20th century, there was hardly a family in Shetland you, who didn't have fishermen, didn't have gutters, didn't have coopers making the barrels, didn't have people working in the ancillary industry. Everybody worked in herring. And it's well known because of its size, its importance, its economic importance. But I would argue that there were really two huge social and cultural changes which the herring fishery brought to Shetland, which transformed Shetland uh, 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 out of where it had been in the 19th century. And the first was the fleet itself. And here's a wonderful picture of the herring fleet leaving Lerwick Harbour, as it did every afternoon, under sail. At this time, there had been 400 Shetland boats, probably 600 Scottish boats, maybe 60 or 80 Arcadian boats. There had been a fleet of Dutch boats. There had been boats from England and even some boats from Norway all sailing out to catch herring around Shetland. Because of the, when the herring fishery in Shetland began in the 1880s, it coincided with a period of quite good prices being paid in Eastern Europe. A lot of money was made at the herring. And initially, the fleet was owned by the merchants, as it had always been. But before too long, and certainly by the 20th century, Shetland fishermen were beginning to buy their own herring boats and buy their own herring nets. And by the outbreak of the First World War, Shetland fishermen, for the first time ever in their history, were the owners of their own vessels. Instead of being meager wage earners fishing for the lairds or the merchants, they became entrepreneurs in their own right. And that laid the foundation for the modern fleet of fisher-owned boats that we have in Shetland today. Huge social change. But the second social change was equally significant, and that's the role of women in Shetland society. During the half and the cod, all the fishing was done by men, but all the processing was done by the beach boys, by the young boys. Women played no direct real role in either the half or the cod. Of course, the half or the cod couldn't have been undertaken without the women looking after the croft when the men were at sea and looking after the, uh, the family and looking after the animals and so on. 
The women's role was absolutely crucial, but it wasn't a direct role. Herring changed all that. For the first time ever, there was a demand for hundreds and then thousands of women to gut herring. You needed people who uh, were quick, dexterous, and women uh, fitted the bill. And uh, they weren't paid very much, but for the first time ever in Shetland history, women were able to independently earn their own money. Huge social change. And it was mostly young women, and becoming a gutter also allowed these young women to escape the claustrophobia of the family croft. In order to be a gutter, you had to move from your crofting township or your little village to Lerwick or Baltisound and stay for the duration of the herring season. And although it was hard work and poorly paid, it was a degree of personal independence as well as financial independence, which uh, for the first time uh, 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 allowed uh, the women of Shetland to perhaps become more independent than they've ever been. In some ways, although the work was hard and although it was poorly paid, in some ways it was almost the kind of university experience for a, a, class and a, a class of young women in Shetland for whom the idea of leaving home and studying was never going to happen. Here was an opportunity to leave home, to live with uh, other gutters away from home and to earn their own money. Um, so it can't be underestimated. So, in, by way of conclusion, these three fisheries, the half and the cod and the herring, dominated uh, Shetland's economy for more than 200 years. And the herring continued and continues right to this day. Drift netting uh, continued right up until the 1970s when it was replaced by pursining and trawling. And of course, herring fishermen in Shetland now fish with very big boats. All the processing is, is mechanized and the herring is frozen rather than being salted. But right up until the 1950s and 60s, there was still salt herring being exported from Shetland. So for more than 200 years, salt fish from Shetland, from the half, from the cod, and laterally from the herring, was exported all over Europe. And I think in these days, when the UK government is turning its back on Europe, it's worth reminding ourselves that Shetland, along with much of Scotland, has had very deep social and economic historical links with Europe. Salt fish was the currency, and the catching and exporting of salt fish created this network of salt roads across Europe, with Shetland at its heart. So the, the, the basis of my lecture tonight, I've written a book uh, about this. Uh, it's called The Salt Roads, How Fish Made a Culture. And in this book, I cover the areas I've spoken about tonight. But I also look at uh, how this 200, this 250 years of salt fish trade with the rest of Europe has inspired a whole range of artists. It's inspired... Uh, poets, novelists, filmmakers, musicians, visual artists, sculptors. Uh, and it brings perhaps a dimension to fishing and the sea that perhaps not many people were aware of. So that uh, whole question of how fish made a culture is going to be the theme of my book launch tonight, which takes place at the Orkney Club at 9 o'clock. So, uh, so that's it. If there are any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Well, that is fascinating, John, and I'm looking for questions. I have actually one to ask you first of all. Uh, it's wondering about the smuggling network, uh, because the fishermen would be able to buy or contract to pay for brandy, but they must have done so in the knowledge that they had a market for it in Shetland, and somebody with capital would be willing to buy it in Shetland. And I'm wondering who those people with capital could have been. My understanding, Howie, was that it, it was, they did three distant water voyages. 
The first one took place in March and they usually ended up in October. So they had the period from November, December, January and February. And I think what happened, the cod fishermen went round their neighbourhood and I think the purchases were quite small on an individual basis to crofters. And uh, I think it was also used for weddings and that kind of thing. So although the quantities being bought in some cases were huge and it was a big enterprise, the sale of it, I think, was very discreet, very low key, because the last thing you wanted to do was draw attention to this. Um, by, uh, in the only archives that exist in Shetland are the archives of when somebody was caught. And people, if they were caught, they were fined 30 or 40 pounds, twice their annual wage. Uh, they had the option of paying that or going to jail for three months. And invariably, all the cod fishermen chose the option of going to jail. It was probably slightly more comfortable than a three-month trip at the cod fishing. <laughs> I'm looking around the audience for questions. And Elizabeth, is, if you were going to... Oh, Elizabeth's passing to Kinley, who's got a question. Hi there, thank you. Um, I just have a question about where did you get all the salt from? Uh, very good question. The salt, uh, when, the, uh, when the salt cod was exported to Bilbao and Santander in northern Spain, the ships came back full of salt. So they went there with salt cod and they came back full of salt. As the herring fishery developed and the supplies of salt from Iberia, be, there wasn't the trading links, then a lot of the salt came from Scotland, I believe, and then also very often from Eastern Europe. So it came from a variety of sources. I see at least one Shetler in the, Shetlander in the audience, a well-known voice in Orkney. I'm sure, Arthur, you would like to ask a question. There he is over there. I just wondered, Sean, about the difference between the, the cod smacks and the half fishing. The half fishing would have been ling. I mean, ling was the thing. Ling and tusk would have been the, the fish that was dried because uh, I, I read a book about Dun Ross and not very long ago, and I mean, that was a phenomenal fishing industry down there, and there's no even a hint of it today. You get nice studies, but you can't get nice fish anymore. Mm -hmm. But I just wondered when the transition came between ling and cod, and when cod became the, the, the top fish rather than the ling, because the ling disappeared completely almost. Yeah. Uh, yeah, no, good question. The, the, the half was ling and tusk, a little bit of safe, and the distant water was cod. But although the half had begun in the 18th century and continued right through the 19th century, and the cod was just a 19th century activity, they, they were together. So for about 100 years, Shetland was exporting ling and tusk, mostly to the rest of the UK and to Ireland, but also in the early years to Jamaica to feed the slaves. So Shetland, like many parts of modern history, wasn't unimplicated, if there is such a word, in the, in the whole slavery business. Not big quantities went there, but some. And then the cod all went to Spain, Spain and Portugal. So for 100 years, there was cod, ling, and cod. And then, of course, they all took a back seat when herring came along. Just wondering, too, about the truck system. Was it really the crofting legislation that broke it? Or was it somehow that a certain amount of cash, a certain amount of capital was coming into Shetland out with the Laird's control and possibly through the smuggling? Yeah, I, I, I think it, it pr although I presented it as the, the Crofters Act was what led to the abandonment of truck, the Crofters Act was clearly a huge part of releasing from the truck system. Uh, and a, a terrible system of bondage. But there were other reasons. Uh, the market forces were coming in. It was beginning, as herring developed, uh, a crofter would say, well, I'm making this much money at the herring, or I can make a bit extra from smuggling at the cod. It doesn't matter if he evicts me from my croft. I'll get a house in Lerwick and be a herring fisherman. So th it was more complicated than that. But before the herring came, before the Crofters Act was passed, all these 
families had was their croft with one cow, a dozen sheep, and the ability to grow potatoes. And that was crucial. And they couldn't ever risk being evicted from that. So that's why the pop and as these crofts were subdivided, the population expanded. Um, so th the demise of truck was complicated, but the Crofters Act was important. I think Arthur has a, another question. I, I have that feeling. I can see the expression on his face, which indicates he does. It's the business of the merchants taking over, because you know and I know that the enterprise was owned half by Charlie's Bake Shop and Larry. And uh, the other five men had a share of the of the half the boat, mm -hmm. and I think that applied to quite a number of boats. But uh, I mean, I just know the enterprise mm -hmm. and, yeah. and know that one. Yeah. No, the, the the process whereby the fishermen became vessel owners it didn't just happen like that. To begin with, the herring boats were owned by merchants, and then gradually the skipper maybe would take a quarter share and a few nets, and within five years, the crew would perhaps own, as Arthur said, half the boat, the merchant would own the other half. But before too long, the fishermen realized they didn't need the merchants to be boat owners. They could eventually get a boat by themselves. And so although the merchants had helped it all take place, the merchants uh, were edged out. Well, um, ah, Maha, has a, Maha has an update from Slido. So yeah, we have got a couple of questions from our online viewers. So just to remind everyone on uh, watching us on YouTube, you can submit your questions from Slido. You need to enter the code 3435541. Um, if you are in this theater and want to, are shy to ask questions and just want to scan that code and maybe go to sl uh, Slido and ask questions, you can do that as well. Um, so a couple of questions have come through. The first question is, um, which was something similar I wanted to ask you as well. How far was the salted cod exported? Uh, the salted cod all went to uh, Spain, a little bit to Portugal, but largely to Spain and largely to the northern part of Spain, into the two ports of Bilbao and Santander. Um, and a few more, if that's okay. Um, what was the extent of herring season in Shetland? And did any of the Shetland boats follow the fish down the UK North Sea coast? Yes, absolutely. The herring season in Shetland usually began in April and continued through until late August, early September. And then by the time the herring fishery became established, uh, they would then go down to the East Anglia to take part in the autumn herring fishery uh, from the ports of Lowestoft and Great Yarmouth. And not only the fishermen traveled there, but also the herring gutters traveled there. So this, all these young, hundreds of young women from Shetland who got a taste of freedom living in Lerwick, they could suddenly go to Great Yarmouth and lost it for a season. It was wonderful. Uh, and that continued for, for many years. And then one last one here on Slido. Uh, there must have been a number of fishermen who didn't make it back to the Faroe to pay their credit for the brandy. Do you know if this was an issue? It's a very good question, and I guess I, I think the credit on the brandy reflected the incredible degree of trust between the merchants and the fishermen, and must have reflected the fact that year after year the same fishermen came back. And there must have been a level, a cultural level, you know, th these weren't foreigners coming into a port and a merchant foolishly giving them a year's credit. These were people he knew personally. You know, they had to build up a lot of personal trust before you would give somebody a year's credit. So I think it said a lot about the very deep cultural relationship between Shetlanders and Faroese at the time, which I think is incredibly important. Um, these were a whole, several generations of Shetlanders who'd never set foot in Aberdeen or Edinburgh, but knew Faroiri and knew Claxvik and knew Torshaven as well as they knew their home village. And... Uh, they were speaking at that time the, the last remnants of Shet, Shetland Norn, Shetlandic, which was very similar to Faroese. So, very close personal relationship. But to answer your question, I guess uh, they took the view that because of this close personal relationship, they would know 
which fishermen not to take a chance on. You know, there's good and bad guys, and they probably wouldn't give the credit to guys they thought they couldn't trust. Clearly, they thought they could trust most of them. And for those fishermen who were lost at sea and couldn't make it back, I guess that was just built into the trade. That's just something that happened. It was nobody's fault. I have a question about Sir, boat yeah. building, but ah, over one over there for the, the roving microphone. Hello. Uh, my grandfather was a cooper based in Lerwick, originally from Leith, who travelled with the fleet all the way down the coast and round, in fact, to Dublin, to Howth. Um, the family left Shetland in the mid to late 30s because I believed there was a big dip in the herring at that time and the family moved to Fraserburgh where my grandfather became the foreman of the barrel factory. So did the herring, in fact, really have a, a big downswing in the 30s? It, it absolutely did. Uh, I mean, it, Shetland's peak was 1905, but it continued right up to the First World War. Uh, it was just boom time, absolute boom time. Up. And then, after the Great War, things had changed irrevocably. First of all, Russia, which was a huge market, no longer existed. There was the Soviet Union, and exporting salt herring to the communist state wasn't as straightforward as it had been under the old Russian system. Secondly, Germany, during the 1920s and 1930s under the Weimar Republic, they'd had such a dreadful experience of starvation during the First World War when the blockade had effectively deprived Germany of food that the Weimar government built up the chairman fleet so that they could be self-sufficient in herring. So the, ch the demand for salt herring from Germany reduced because they were supplying it themselves. The demand from Russia reduced because of the communist system just didn't, wasn't, didn't allow exports to be so easily made. So the whole price and demand for salt herring reduced. So that led to not a collapse, but a decline. You're absolutely right. Lots of boats were sold. The fleet reduced in size. And it still continued, but the, the incredible boom leading up to the First World War uh, was never repeated. It remained important, but, but there was a dip. While I'm asking John the next one, if you want to book a question, if you catch Elizabeth's eye with the microphone, she'll bring it over to you. My question was on boat building, John, because a development of fishing on this scale must have required a considerable development of boat building. And you also mentioned the innovation with which the boat builders were able to develop a system that could take live cod to last down to Grimsby. To what extent did the, the boat building industry respond to the demand and did they need to bring in something from outside, whether boat builders themselves or buy in boats from outside to augment what could be built locally? Yeah, good, good question. Uh, Great boat building skills in Shetland through building six arenes. They'd flat packed them in Norway and assembled them in Shetland, the early IKEA. And then after that stop, the Shetlanders built them to the Norwegian design. So all of the skills, all the carpentry skills were there. The cod smacks, uh, very few cod smacks were built in Shetland. They were nearly all bought from England. Uh, some had been sailing trawlers, some had been navy cutters there was really a whole variety of designs. They were all bought second-hand. A few were built locally. Uh, but when they came to fit the wells, the seawater wells, that was pretty much all done in Shetland. So they, they didn't build many smacks, but they refitted a lot of them. And the herring fleet, um, to begin with, Shetlanders bought second-hand boats from the northeast of Scotland, and then gradually began to build new boats. Some new boats were built in Shetland. The Swan that I had a picture of that comes down here. She was built in Haysdock in Lerwick in 1900, uh, but mostly they were built in the northeast of Scotland. Uh, and, but then there were a whole variety of yards that did repairs in Lerwick. There was a yard at Sandwick in, the, in 
the South Mainland that Arthur was talking about, and, and their speciality was taking wooden boats, cutting them in half, and sticking a bit in the middle to make them a bit longer. Uh, so incredible things that these people did, and all they had was hammers, nails, and saws. There was no, it was, uh, it was really an incredible period of innovation. So, so it was a mixture of all of those things. And for wood, they would have to import? Uh, all the wood was imported, yeah, absolutely. Treeless landscape and shape. Was that Norway primarily for the wood? Uh, it, to begin with, when the uh, six arenes were flat packed, that was all Norwegian timber. Uh, and, but when the, sh the reason why the flat packs from Norway stopped was that after the Napoleonic Wars, the, the, there was the, the duty placed on imports into the UK from Norway were quite high, so they began to import wood from Scotland, and then they just built them from scratch to the Norwegian design. I have a, Nor a Napoleonic War question, but before I put it, I'm just looking around the audience to check. This is an opportunity to ask. I, th I think after I've put this one, Arthur has another one. So my Napoleonic War question is, you spoke about the need for the Lairds to have plenty of people to work, and there was a similar situation in Orkney in the Napoleonic Wars with the kelp industry, the Lairds needed with people, needed people. But in both Orkney and Shetland, the government also needed seafaring men to press mm -hmm. into the navy. To what extent did the press gang affect Shetland? To, to what extent did the Lairds actually try to keep it away simply because it was taking valuable men, or to what extent they just had to accept it? I think they probably had to accept it, although there were all kinds of escape routes and hiding places where the young boys and young men who were, who the Royal Navy tried to press into the Navy at the time of the Napoleonic Wars, tried to escape. But, but huge numbers were taken, and they had to very often spend 10 years in the Navy before they got home. Um, so it was a drain on manpower, but clearly the population of Shetland was increasing, so you had the half. 3,000 men, various estimates of perhaps 1,000, 2,000 men in the Royal Navy at the time in the Napoleonic Wars, 1,000 men on Greenland whalers, 1,000 men on the cod smacks. There weren't many men left at home with all of that going on. Uh, but yeah, it, it, it would have been another, another source. But paradoxically, the Napoleonic Wars weren't all bad because it was when the Napoleonic Wars ended that the Iberian market opened up again and paid fantastic prices for cod. And it was Arthur Anderson, the founder of P&O Ferries, who was a young Shetlander who himself had been press ganged into the Royal Navy. After his 10 years in the Royal Navy, he didn't go back to Shetland. He decided to make his fortune in London, which he did. And uh, during his time uh, as a shipping agent and while he was founding Peninsular and Orient, uh, 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 shipping line um, and he was involved in all kinds of things he spent a lot of time in Spain and he could see the value of, of salt cod so what he did, he came back to Shetland and set up a, a salt cod enterprise and he discovered that if you bled the fish properly used the right kind of salt laid it out to dry for the right amount of time you could increase the value now most entrepreneurs finding that value that would increase your market, would have kept it to themselves. He published a newspaper and shared all of those secrets with all of the Shetland lairds and merchants. And that was one of the reasons why the whole cod fishery took off. A remarkable man, a very generous thing to do. Um, he did well out of it, but he shared his expertise he built up. And that allowed Shetland cod to get this wonderful reputation in the Basque country, where the Shetland cure was sought after for the best cuts of bacalao, and that endured for about 50 years. There's just time for Arthur to have a closing word if Elizabeth comes down to him. <laughs> While she's going down to him, I'll mention, just to follow up, the next, in half an hour's time, John will, as mentioned, be talking about the impact on Shetland culture. Harlan the Drogue and Guy the Boys a Biscuit, and you can find out what the Drogue is and why the boys deserve the biscuit. But Arthur, final word from you. you. You mentioned Arthur Anderson. I mean, we know the, about the school and the hostel and all the rest of it. But 
Do you have any idea why uh, Wise didn't become uh, a, a fishing station? Because he did, he built the pier and he set up a fishing industry there which, which seemed to fail, I don't know why. And yet, at, at the similar time, there was, there was absolutely nothing in Hamnevo whatsoever. Yeah. Because, what would you say, 1936, I mean, what was his name? The Hacker Boy that wrote the book. 19, uh, yeah. 1836, there was one pretty Houston on the beach in Hamnevo with, with nothing else there. Yeah. And no, I, I suppose it just, it, it all developed at different times. It, it, where Arthur Anderson set up his operation was in Vela, near yeah. Waz, and, and it continued for a long time. It was a big, big centre. But as the cod fishery then declined, places like Hamnevo mushroomed with the herring. So it was just as the half, the cod and the herring came and went, different parts of Shetland developed and increased and so on. So it's, it, it, it's a fascinating story. Yeah. It's been a great story this evening, John. Our warmest thanks to you. And before rounding off and giving you a big thank you, I'd like to thank the technical team for doing absolutely amazing things behind the, the scenes. I'd like to thank our audience here in the Phoenix Cinema in Kirkwall and our audience online. And John, warmest thanks to you. And I'd ask everyone to join me in echoing that. Thank you yeah. indeed, John.